Welcome to today's event titled Opportunities and Challenges for Exiled North Korean Women in the Human Rights Field. My name is Kyung Min Shin, and I'm a project lead at Korea Future. Korea Future is a non-profit, non-governmental organization investigating human rights violations in North Korea in support of accountability and justice actors from our offices in Seoul, London, and The Hague. We work alongside and with the diaspora in South Korea and the United Kingdom, and we conduct capacity building projects for exiled women in the diaspora to support their entry into the civil society space. In today's event, we'll hear from expert speakers on some of the opportunities and challenges facing women across civil society, both here in South Korea and across the world. Our overarching theme or question is, how can grant makers and civil society actors best support women and women-led organizations in the civil society space? I am delighted to be joined by three speakers, Selnar Ahmed from IMPACT, Clara Bosco from Civicus, and Esther Um from UNICID. Today's event marks the launch of our new report, Opportunities and Challenges for Exiled North Korean Women in the Human Rights Field, which is available from our website. In this report, we identify some of the key challenges that hinder North Korean exiled women from entering civil society, which are competition for grants, limited networking opportunities, caregiving responsibilities, mental health, and knowledge gaps, to name a few. We also suggest in the report that if the civil society space is to become more inclusive, gender aware, and take steps to ensure the full inclusion of exiled women, the dialogue between exiled women, grant makers, and existing civil society actors is first required, alongside the reimagining of traditional funding models, conversations on organizational sustainability and the formation of interventions that provide clear pathways for young exiled women to pursue careers in civil society. Hopefully we can touch on some of these points today. Moving to today's event, women and women's organization play a critical role in bringing their knowledge, experiences, leadership, and skills to interventions designed to address the commission of mass human rights violations across the world. One caveat, of course, is that women continue to be under-resourced, undervalued, less feasible than men, and have fewer platforms to make their voices heard in civil society. These are conversations that we, civil society, and grant makers and other stakeholders need to have in everyday context if civil society is to become more effective and representative. That includes making space, resourcing, and reimagining how civil society works for exiled women in the diaspora. In the North Korea experience, we know that 72% of the diaspora are women, yet 68% of leadership roles in civil society are held by men. While this is a statistical oversimplification of a more complex issue, it does make a rather blunt point on the absence of women relative to their majority position in the diaspora and experiences and knowledge of women being the majority experience and knowledge. The format of our today's event is something equivalent to a round table where our expert speakers will discuss some of the most pressing issues when it comes to women in civil society. We will start with an introduction. So first of all, um, introduce myself very quickly. My name is Jalnar Ahmad. I'm originally from Syria. I live in Germany and I work with Impact Civil Society Research and Development Organization. We are a civil society organization that was established in Germany by Syrian diaspora uh, and works towards the goal of supporting so, um, civil society actors, especially local actors, uh, to, to gain their voice and assume their role and space. Uh, we focus mainly on Syria, in addition to some work in Iraq and the MENA region, uh, also working with diaspora and civil society actors in Europe uh, who originate from the Middle East countries. Um, towards this goal, we have different types of programming, including uh, one of, of our main programs is research. So we conduct research that looks into the, <clears throat> the status and the space of civil society, the challenges that face civil society actors, including mapping of actors, but also looking at specific factors. Uh, 
um, and policy-oriented research to uh, donors, grants making, and other decision-making um, uh, foras and uh, decision makers. Um, and other programs, we work in civil society support program. That's one of our major programs where we provide provide a comprehensive capacity building and support to local and national community-based organizations, civil society organizations, and grassroots initiatives in terms of capacity building, access to funding resources, but also access to networking and, uh, and different types of resources that can help them grow. Um, this is also connected to our other program of diaspora engagement, where we work with diaspora organization on networking initiatives, trying to bring them together on the table for discussions, but also with their peers, with their counterparts and with decision makers. Um, we also have other programs focusing more on, on civil um, <clears throat> uh, peace building and uh, local dialogues uh, to give the voice back to, to locals, to uh, people on the ground who actually are aware of their context to, to develop their own uh, policy um, priorities. Um, within all these programs, we always have a focus on gender inclusive and uh, gender sensitivity, in addition to women participation. Uh, so for example, within uh, the civil society support program, we always uh, have like a, a quota or a minimum threshold of women-led organization or women-focused organizations to be included. Um, in addition, within the capacity building civil society support program, we work with the organization on uh, on their policies or their regulations, how to in develop their internal <clears throat> uh, structures in a way that can be more gender inclusive and more supportive to, to women. Uh, so this is always a priority in our uh, support for local organizations. Um, in the research, we have also did several projects related to, uh, to the issue of inclusion of women, uh, including mapping and <clears throat> analysis of Syrian and uh, like feminist and women focused organizations. Um, and we published a research three years ago on gender dynamics within Syrian civil society um, that provide us with the basis that we build based on these recommendations, a lot of our other uh, projects and interventions. So well, first, first, thank you very much for, for inviting us um, into this space. Um, my name is Clara Bosco and I work with Civicus um, as, a, as a senior advisor on civil society resourcing. Civicus is a global alliance dedicated to strengthen civil society and, and citizen action for expanded civic and democratic space. Um, we are a member-based alliance. Um, we have over 14,000 members in over 175 countries and um, our members really span a wide range of issues, sizes and organization types. So we're not focused on any specific topic. Our members are really representing the whole spectrum of civil society writ large. And we work together with them to monitor violations of basic civic freedoms, call out the perpetrators of violations and strengthen the power of people to organize um, by supporting a more accountable, a more effective and more innovative civil society. So, um, we strive to promote particularly excluded voices, especially uh, within the global south. And um, we're about to turn 30 this year. We were we were established in 1993, and um, and since 2002, uh, we have been uh, we have a, uh, we are we have been headquartered in in Johannesburg in South Africa, although we have uh, smaller offices in other parts of the world and many colleagues distributed around around the world. Um, so my work as an, as, a, as an advisor on civil society resourcing has been to, to, to try to leverage uh, the, the visibility and the credibility and the networks of Civicus Global Alliance to push for more and better resources for the sector writ large, but especially to, uh, to, to mobilize more and better resources for smaller and less formal groups in civil society which are the part of our membership that we know, we keep on hearing um, year after year, are the ones that are struggling the most to um, mobilize the kinds of resources and solidarity that they need. So this is an area of work that kind of cuts across the, the, the different kinds of things that Civicus does from analysis, global analysis, some convenings, some influencing advocacy, but also some direct support to some of these groups and right? trying to walk the talk as well and being more accessible and relevant when we offer resources and, 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 and support to these groups. Um, now, looking at um, 
sort of aspects of Civicus work that are more related to engagement with women in civil society, um, we, we always document and amplify the women's impact in our societies, acknowledging that, of course, they are amongst historically marginalized groups, um, and uh, but also, you know, that they are a power, a source of power and, and in mobilization in, um, in, in our societies. Um, so we do document and amplify their brave work, um, their impactful organizing for positive change and denounce the restrictions in their civic freedom. So there are some angles um, that all our analysis be it in the civic space monitor, where we monitor civic space restrictions or being in our global state of civil society report analysis, there's always an angle on the struggles um, and, and victories and, and backlash um, that women organizing is facing around the world. Um, we also try to, um, um, we are quite active at the commission of the status of women. So we try to, around the time where there's the annual meeting in, in New York, we always try to, um, amplify voices of women and women organizations. We try to call on the governments to prioritize gender equality and, and foster women's rights movements. Um, um, we try to organize side convenings, um, side events in the wings of, of CSW to make sure that some of the issues that women want to bring to the attention of, of, the, uh, you know, of, of, of those deliberations can have more space and visibility. Um, and um, you know, um, th this is a bit one of the things that we do um, every year. And then, of course, internally, we, we try to be accountable as well. Um, we've signed, for example, the Accountable NAR Charter, and one of the 12 accountability commitments is about promoting women's rights and girls' rights and enhance gender equality. And so this is something that we try to do, not only in our programs, but also um, within our own organization. It's, it's a commitment. Of course, it's a journey. There's always room for improvement, and that's what we do. Um, we've signed the Fair Share Pledge, which could be pertinent for this conversation, is, is a pledge that has been introduced, I would say, three years ago, more or less, and it's calling on all social impact organizations to achieve a fair share on women leadership by 2030. So trying to make sure that the, 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 the share of women in leadership position reflects the share of women in those organizations. So there's an acknowledgement that there is a big imbalance. There are many women employed in civil society, but very few make it to leadership positions. And that, of course, reflects on the culture of the organization, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm going to stop there. I think in a nutshell, I mean, it's difficult to summarize all the things that Civicus does being a global alliance, but there's always a special angle as I said, in, in, the, in the analysis that we do, in the advocacy that we do, um, when it comes to specific uh, needs and specific um, asks um, that relate to women, women in civil society. I would say both. So we, we can see uh, positive trends about women inclusion or women participation in, uh, in civil society in general, and also in working with the factors to elevate the factors that pre prevent them from actually participating in that. But still, these are still 
not on the pace that should be. It's still less efforts than should be done on this. And the barriers and the challenges are way more than the enablers factors for this. Um, in terms of donors and grants making policies, we see a shift in the last years, maybe in the last decade, toward more focus on uh, on inclusion of women, especially in decision making processes or in the um, administrative and managerial structures of the organizations. Um, we see a lot of funding programs that evolves mainly to to do this, but still, this is not significant enough. It's still overall in a in a broader look, um, women still disadvantaged in this sector as in any other um, sectors. Um, there's unfortunately not really clear available data on, on the amounts of fundings that go to support women in civil society. Um, but for example, from the Syrian context in 2014, there was an estimation that only 0.5% of funding was going to women-led organization. Uh, this, this number is not completely accurate. It's based on estimation because there is no available data on this, but it can give us an indicator that this is we are still talking about a small fraction um, of the of the grant making money that's going to to this focus. Uh, but in general, in the in the in the policies, in the decisions, we have been seeing a change. We have been seeing a shift. And this is mainly made because of women activists in civil society who have been pushing to, to claim their space. Uh, a lot of efforts has been done by women in this field to uh, to broaden their, their participation, uh, to overcome the barriers. And I think we will, we will talk more about the barriers for inclusion of women um, in a bit. Uh, but th the efforts of feminist and women organization are starting to pay, but as I said, it's still not significant. It's still the pace is very minimal. Um, and this is we are talking only about things related to the structure of the organizations or the funding programs, but other challenges still persist, including contextual challenges related to um, security, social, economic, and other uh, contexts that also limits in a lot of cases women's participation um, as it does in other uh, fields of life. Um, so in terms of the, um, our assessment on, on the health and, and strength of, of women in, in civil society, we see that more and more women in civil society worldwide are, are working collectively um, to challenge structural injustices and to promote the realization of human rights and fundamental freedoms. According to the Civicus Monitor um, data, just in 2021, um, women's rights were a major, major focus of protests, including protests um, around gender-based violence in countries like Austria, Canada, Pakistan, Mali, Mexico, and South Africa, or mobilizing for the protection of the reproductive rights in many, many parts of the world, such as in Chile, Croatia, Dominican Republic, El Salvador, Poland, in the US. Women are leading protests for climate justice, and of course, we've seen countries like, for example, Afghanistan, women protesting to demand rights to work and rights to education under the, the new Taliban run government. So, you know, there's there's no shortage of, of examples of women really being at the front line of of um, of changes and, 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 you know, mobilizing and organizing. Um, so these mass mobilizations um, have led to reforms in political systems in, 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 in some instances and you know, in, in expanded protection of sexual and reproductive health rights. Um, and you know, women's, girls and trans people's rights organizations are at the front for, forefront of these struggles and, and, and these victories in, in a way. But yet, and we're I think 26 years after the ratification of the Beijing Platform for Action, um, we, we do see that, you know, gender justice is still not a reality for most women. So there's, uh, you know, there are wins, but we're still far from, from, from seeing these um, equality a reality for many. Um, and also, you know, despite this mass mobilizations, despite the, the numerous campaigns and policy interventions orchestrated by women in civil society, by activists, by lawyers, um, as I said, um, full equality is still far from being realized. Um, what we see at Civicus is that women face a kind of a triple jeopardy. On one hand, from state endorsed restrictions and violence arising from their civil society work. So really for, for them mobilizing, for, for them trying to organize, et cetera. There's an aspect 
the, sec the second um, geopardy has to do more with the misogynist backlash for them. They're challenging patriarchal norms within their societies, within their communities and families. And then the lack of resources and community care to deal with the psychosocial pressures and harm from doing this work. And so the stark reality, unfortunately, is that despite the incredible work and the incredible gains that we are seeing that are really under our eyes, women rights organizations continue to be chronically under-resourced. This, um, this is a fact. Um, and and um, um, I'm trying to think of the, of the next question. You, you were saying something about um, uh, trends, positive trends in, in women being able to access civil society. I think the trends go in, in both directions. If if I if I were if I was to say it sort of in, in a short sentence and in cycles. Now, so on one hand, as I said, they are one of the groups that are experiencing more restrictions. But on the other hand, we have seen you know, victories. And if you think of um, what's going on uh, with this relentless attack on abortion rights that is led by you know right wing politicians and and really has a connection across across the world. You also see, on the other hand, that despite some challenges, you see successes, for example, across Latin America, we've witnessed over the last years, um, no, like in Colombia, Ecuador, in Mexico, in, in, in El Salvador, um, restrictions being removed or eased. So there's a bit of both, uh, and, it, and it comes in cycles. Um, it's, it's also difficult to detect you know, what produced the ch change really often results from court victories that follow years of legal action, years of organizing, years of mobilizing. So you can't really see, I think it's, 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 it's something that is, 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 is a contested space. And as such, you know, there are pushbacks, there are openings, and, and that's, I think, the trend that we see. Um, but I mean, you you know, the, the mass displays of the strength of, of, of global women's movements are are in front of our eyes. We see we see often, uh, you know, big women's mobilizations around the world, which is important for communicating resistance to repression and aspirations for change. That making it visible, you know, the mobilization, the amounts of of, of women that are mobilized um, behind these agendas, does does make a difference. Um, One thing to say, though, is that, as I said, I mean, because of that, the, the, for example, the Civitas, the Civicus Monitor has um, detected that women are one of the five top groups that um, often um, incur in, 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 civic, in civic space restrictions. Um, in fact, um, in 2021, I think 32% of all Civicus updates, Civicus Monitor updates on restrictions to civic freedoms related to women and women's groups. So it is, it is as I said, it, it, it is a contested space. They are really one of the most targeted groups when it comes to restrictions. There's that triple jeopardy that I was mentioning. And at the same time, we see expansion of rights, expansion and um, expansion of rights, but also spaces that are reclaimed, that are created by women that, that you know, are transformative and are, and are, and are uh, you know, um, and are countering that trend. Um, when, it, when we look at the grant makers um, and, if, and their awareness, let's say, on, on the challenges that are traditionally faced by women, it's really just my impression, but, but I think that overall there seems to be more awareness than, for example, five years ago, um, at least within more progressive circles. Um, and I think there is growing recognition of how innovative, bold, and inclusive are, for example, feminist funds, so grant makers that have embraced feminist principles or women's funds, um, as well as how bold, innovative are their more joined up resourcing, resource mobilization strategies. So I think in, in, in a way there is more awareness. And, and for example, if you, th if you think of, uh, if you look at ODA, the, the official development assistance data, um, there is this gender net network that has been now consistently trying to track over time uh, how much of, of uh, how much of um, of the ODA flows 
um, are allocated for gender equality and women's empowerment. And they even introduced a dedicated statistical code in the what they called OECD creditor reporting system that is trying to capture the support for women's rights organizations and movements as, 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 um, as an indicator. So there is more attention. There's now there's more evidence and data that is being collected to understand the state of resourcing for women's organizing. Um, so ODA gender net data, um, I think, um, uh, affirm that um, there's been a steady increase in funding going on a, on a, around going for areas that pertain to gender equality um, writ large. Now, when it comes to the direct funding to women's organizations, I don't, I don't think they could have, they, I don't think they have affirmed that there has been this steady growth. It's kind of stay, staying around the same. And I think this is a bit, um, I, I think this is what we need to, to, to vis make more visible right now. So there's a growing understanding. Uh, there's an, there's a, there's, there, need, there needs to be more funding, more resourcing, but um, in general, it is not going yet as much as it should directly to women's rights organizations. So it's more funding the theme, funding the area, not necessarily understanding that it, we need to, to, to resource more and better the, the groups that are at the front line of these, um, of these challenges. I think another, another example is Generation Equality Forum. No? Last year, um, they managed to pledge, uh, I think, 40 billion dollars and according to AWID analysis um, I think just two billion of, of that amount was going to be has been pledged directly to women's um, organizations and, and feminist groups so again it there's a there's a trend in, in, in that it's um it's an area where there's growing attention but we need to insist more on the need to support more and better Women's women's organizations and, and 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 the support infrastructure that is designed to support women's organizations. Um, what else? Um, one thing perhaps could have to do with the lack of knowledge on the important work that women uh, rights groups do. Um, I think that the um, the tendency is to focus more on on the challenges that they face and not on the important work that they do. And, um, and that could, in a way, also um, uh, erase the, you know, the, the, their experience of, um, of oh, sorry, how to say, recognizing them only for the restrictions maybe can erase a bit that need to visibilize the important work that they do and to motivate for more funding going to these groups. And so I think, one thing we know we need to all uh, be paying more attention to is how we portray the challenges that they face and how we balance that because they do face challenges but how we balance that with 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 a narrative that is more about the important essential work that they do to push up to push forward a progressive agenda for change for all no the, 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 the impact that, that these um, groups and movements have on our societies writ large I'm 가장 중요한 거는 음, 새로운 도전에서 어, 그 뭐라고 해야 되나 공부의 총량이 조금 다른 것 같아요. 작은 도전에서 왔기 때문에 이, 이렇게 세계 시민 교육 같은 것들 들어본 적도 없고 배워본 적이 없었기 때문에 이게 음, 그런 부분에 대한 이런 교육이라든지 그런 게 많이 노출돼 있었어야지 사회를 위해서 음, 내가 뭔가 할수 있는 생각을 할수 있겠고 가장 중요한 거는 새로운 곳에 와서 
본인들의 생존에 관한 게 우선이다 보니까 어, 자기가 일단 자기 자신을 챙겨야 그 다음에 사회인으로서 개인이 아닌 사회인으로서 나를 어, 네, 어떻게 성장해 갈고 어떤 영향을 미치면서 살수 있는지를 생각해 볼수 있는데 일단 자기 챙기는 것도 힘들기 때문에 조금 어렵다는 생각을 하고 있고 그나마 대한민국에서 공부할 수 있는 기회를 줘서 대학을 간다든지 이렇게 좀 배울 수 있는 조건에 있는 분들은 좀 많이 선택하고 있는, 있다고 는있 보고 있는데 그런 분들이 또 하기에는 어, 저 같은 경우는 또 보니까 비용비가 뭔지 용비가 뭔지도 모를 정도로 전혀 모르는 상황에서 그냥 열정 하나로 뛰어들다 보니까 쉽지는 않았던 것 같고 어, 그런 걸 보면 어, 좀 어, 열정 하나로는 좀 어렵다라는 생각이 좀 있어요. 그래서 펀딩 뭐 이런 것도 뭐 정보가 있어야 되는데 이렇게 우리는 그런 정보 화된 데서 살아온 경험이 없기 때문에 정보 취득이 되게 어려운 것 같고 정보 취득을 한다고 해도 음 그런 펀딩을 어떻게 해야 되는지 어떤 시청을 통해서 어떻게 할수 있는지 이런 정보가 부족하다 보니까 정보도 부족하고 그 그런 업무를 해본 적이 없잖아요. 음, 그래서 이런 뭐 사회복지단체라든지 시민활동단체에서 활동을 하다 보면 그런 경험이 있으면 좀할수 있는데 우리가 여기서 어, 좀 오래 살아야만 그런 경험을 가질 게될 거고 음, 그러다 보니까 조금 어려운 것 같아요. 그래서 본인이 하기에는 더욱이 더 어렵고 제사 하기에는 어, 대신 이렇게 참여를 할 수는 있을 것 같은데 참여도 아까 얘기했듯이 일단 자기를 자기가 이 사회의 짐이 아니고 어, 이 사회의 한 구성원으로서 잘 살아가는 것만도 사회 어, 사회 시민으로서 다 하는 거라고 생각하고 있기 때문에. 그거가 또 우선이고 저는 맞다고 생각하고 있고 그래서 아직 나왜 사회인으로서 나를 아직까지는 하는 친구들이 그렇게 많지는 않다라는 생각이 드는데 어, 탈북 여성들이 비율로 볼 때는 탈북민들이 여성이 많기 때문에 비율적으로 남친보다는 여성들이 그런 걸 하는 단체들이 좀더 많다고 생각 들어요. 단 이런 일들을 하고 있는 데서 저희가 어, 이런 비즈니스 뭐 이렇게 장사 경험은 있지만 기업이랑 개인 장 사업이랑은 다르잖아요. 그런 경험이 좀 없기 때문에 어, 이런 운영에 대한 것들 유지 그러니까 번차 유지하기도 좀 힘든 것 같아요. 그러니까 번 확장하기 위해서 더 많은 걸 하려는 것도 지금 어, 생각 못 하는 건 아니지만 그것까지는 엄두 못 내고 유지를도 계속 하고 싶고 또 확장도 하고 싶고 한데 어, 전 시작해서 지금 저는 유지 정도 하고 있는데 또 확장하고 싶은데 음, 저희 같은 거는 8년 동안 해왔으니까 확장할 생각까지 하고 있는 것 같고 시작 못 하는 친구들이 되게 많은 것 같아요 이런 어, 단체를 어떻게 이끌어 가야 되는지 어떻게 만들어 가야 되는지 그 어, 구체적인 것들 너무 많이 이렇게 행정 업무들이 있는 게 힘들어서 뭐, 어, 시작 못하는 친구들이 많은 것 같고 음, 근데 8년 해오다 보니까 느낀 건데 어, 확장하고 싶은데 확장을 하려고 하면 이럴 사람들이 더 많이 필요하고 그러다면 그 사람들의 인건비를 줘야 되는데 에, 그게 아까 얘기 질문할 때 얘기했듯이 국내에서는 사업비 비용밖에 안 되기 때문에 지금 많은 단체들이 해외 눈을 돌리고 있다 어, 이런 소식도 듣고 저는 아직 저희 단체는 신청해본 적이 없지만 저희도 지금 시도하는 중에 있고요. 
그래서 좀더 기회를 주기 위해서는 이런 탈북민 단체들에 좀 어, 지원을 해준다면 이 사람들이 더 활동할 수 있는 어, 그리고 더, 더 접할 수 있는 기회가 되지 않을까 싶어요. 그게 꼭 먹고 사는 게 해결돼야만 그런 생각을 하는 게 아니고 어떠한 환경에 의해서 생길 수도 있고 그렇기 때문에 어, 그런 환경을 계속 노출시킬 필요는 있다는 라 생각이 드는 거죠. 그래서 탈북민 단체들의 좀 열악하고 이런 단체들이 할수 있는 기회를 좀 많이 준다면 이런 생각, 세계 시민으로서의 생각을 못하던 사람들에게 그 세계 시민으로서 생각해 볼수 있는 교육이라든지 활동들을 계속 지원한다 하면 어, 좀더 많은 사람들이, 많은 탈북민들이 어, 또 성장하는 계기가 되지 않을까. 참여, 시민활동에 참여하는 계기가 되지 않을까 생각합니다. 아 s I just mentioned, like the challenges are um, far-reaching, and they are from from every corner and on every level. Um, and we can talk about challenges, I think, for for days. But um, I will also go back to the to the research that we worked on on gender dynamics within civil society, because it in this in this peer report we mainly try to identify what are the challenges that face women in entering civil society organizations and in. Working and still like having their own space in in this um, in this field, uh, and these can be divided into internal and external factors. So external factors starting from the context, the stability of the um, um, of the context, like in the political and uh, uh, geopolitical context of the place they are working on, um, especially uh, like when we are talking about Syria with the different um, de facto authorities and areas of control that resulted from the from the civil war currently. Uh, the the con the security situation and the safety of women to actually go and participate in the public sphere plays a major role in a lot of spaces in either enabling or hindering them from from being active in a public sphere. Um, but other than the security, even we're talking about more stable areas where the security limitations are not there. Um, social context uh, contextual factors are always a uh, um, a factor because. Uh, still um, and we see it globally unfortunately and it's of course not uh, not on the same level everywhere but still women are mostly confined to private spheres to domestic use uh, to domestic um, uh, chores and uh, obligations and uh, this this is a social pressure that puts a lot of stereotypes and uh, uh, hinders women participation in in civil society as in any other public sphere uh, but other than the externals, and this also include, of course, the funding restrictions and the donors policy that we just like um, talked about, uh, but also the internal structures of a lot of the organizations don't reflect that. And especially when we are talking about nascent, immature, uh, newly emerging initiatives that they still don't have the, the structural and the policy basis to accommodate to women's need, for example, um, including sometimes minimal and small stuff, but on the long term, it has a cumulative effect. Like, for example, if HR policies have something that accommodate for women's needs, like maternity leave, for example, or um, care providers for uh, for their children where they can go to work and actually not be worried that they don't have a, someone or a place to, to put their children in. Uh, the lack of policies is um, is evident in a lot of, of areas. I uh, I know from the Syrian context that it's still a major issue. Um, a lot of donors and funding agendas, and especially donors who have more of a feminist uh, approach to, to funding, are starting to pay attention to this. I would say in the last couple of years, we have starting to see it like when there is a grant one of the main restrictions are to review the policies or to make sure that it's gender inclusive whether on a project level or on the organization level um, but this is also 
this is not like a, a factor that's um, isolated. They are all very connected together. Uh, and one of the factors, for example, we identified a lot is related to the awareness of uh, of gender inclusion and gender related topics, even the word gender. So when we are not talking about a context where English is the major uh, or the main language, um, the lack of awareness and um, understanding same understanding of the concepts are not always evident and this uh, because a lot of the resources on this field have been produced in english and not really in local languages uh, there's always a gap in in understanding on are we really talking about the same thing when we are talking about gender are we really talking about the same thing when we are talking about women inclusion um the lack of uh, of access to resources and especially in local languages is one of the barriers to develop an understanding that can be the basis basically to to work on issues like the policies or the funding restrictions um or even to try to work with the contextual ch challenges that sometimes feel that are way beyond control including the um, geopolitical and security situations or also the social norms in general Yes, gender sensitivity has always been a problem for us as well. We have different mm -hmm. of it. Um, it. It's something that we have to tackle <laughs> as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In, in Arabic, that re recently there has been, um, in the last, I would say, five to six years in Syrian civil society, and especially a lot of feminist and women organization, there has been a greater focus on knowledge production. Um, and this is very important and very significant and it will pay with the years because now a lot of organizations are able to access um, publications, whether uh, translated or like originally produced about these topics to increase the knowledge and focus on local knowledge production, not just like, yeah, getting um, articles and academics essays and translating them because here the translation also make this gap, but rather focus on local knowledge production to, to forge an understanding. It does not matter how gender is defined in the dictionary. It matters how we agree on it within, within our sphere. Um, and I think, yeah, that's why I mentioned before that a lot of the progress that has been made, it's been made because of the of pushing of women activists who have been putting a lot of pressure on this. And these efforts are starting to accumulate, um, including yeah, knowledge production and make, working on, on forming an understanding of, of the topics that is relevant to context and not just like copy paste from other um, from other context. Um... Well, I can imagine the challenges that um, exiled women may face in these regards, because I, I, I noticed that many funders funding strategies are single issued. So unless you tick a, a box, unless you find ourselves clearly squarely under that funding strategy, it is difficult for you to fit there. But going back, so I'd, I'd be very curious to see your findings, um, if possible, um, in, in that report. But going back to your question, so I guess young women entering civil society face similar challenges that young women would face accessing other sectors. The major difference, perhaps, is that dissonance between the stark reality and civil societies doing good rhetoric, no? where it is kind of denied that um, there's any possible affiliation with misogynist, ageist, or even racist traits in the sector, right? So that's, I think that's the difficulty because um, of course the sector is not immune from mainstream societal cultures inside with which these organizations you know, exist. Uh, and yet there's a denial because they are the organizations that are there doing good and that they could never be you know, um, uh, uh, reflecting any, any of these um, excluding uh, cultural traits. Um, but indeed, I think that education, awareness, and, and definitely advocating on the importance of supporting a diverse and vibrant civil society are important ways to counter this. And I, and I will insist on, on the need to insist, to, to emphasize, you know, the, the need to have a vibrant and diverse civil society as a key pillar of our democracies and our societies. And um, we've, we've heard a lot from our members how this is not actually a common and a common belief in their communities in their in their societies they are struggling to access um 
government for uh, decision making spaces or or even to be listened by governments because there is not this common understanding on how important it is to to ensure the different voices within civil societies are enabled to stay relevant to speak out to organize because you know this is the essence of dem democracies and, and 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 democratic freedoms so for them they often come back to us to say there is a lot of things that we that that we kind of recommend or that we try to advocate for that kind of imply this is that everybody agrees with this that about this important and essential role whereas this is not the case so again going back to what i was saying before i think it's important for all of us to reimagine narratives where we try to win back hearts and minds of people um, about the importance of supporting and and defending and promoting a sector that is vibrant and diverse um, so as I was saying before, I think the space is contracting and expanding at the same time. And the more, you know, uh, um, some wins are made and, and social norms and, and traditional social norms are challenged, you know, the, the more you, you, you push forward, the, you know, the more backlash you get. So there's, there's kind of, um, that, of, a, of a never ending dynamic there, I, I would say. Uh, what I what I wanted to touch on, which uh, which struck me from 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 your question, is is that culture of mission driven martyr, martyrdom, which is definitely widespread in the sector and it's very problematic. It's been called out both in humanitarian and development circles, but from our experience, um, also um, also grassroots activists are starting to talk about these as something that is really, really problematic and, and toxic, uh, even, even, even at grassroots level. Uh, so mental health issues are taboo, toxic. Um, organizational cultures do not even allow being vulnerable or accepting you know, failure as part of you know, uh, trying things and failing. Or, um, or, or even showing insecurity. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a whole range of accepted behaviors within the sector that really push more for um, um, yeah uh, people uh, always being successful uh, never you know showing a sign of, of uncertainty of hesitation of of um, of uh, exhaustion and um, but now there have been some some scandals now on, on, on the well-being of staff in NGO in NGOs in, in, in NGOs for sure. I, I even recall a couple of suicides um, from staff uh, belonging to well-renowned NGOs a couple of years ago. Um, suicides that were directly related to their um, toxic environment uh, in the workplace. Um, I think there is a process of reckoning that it's starting in the sector about this and, and how toxic, toxic this, this culture is. Um, but I think we're really at the tip um, of the iceberg. Um, I see as a reaction to these scandals and, and to this reckoning that many of these organizations are now embracing more feminist principles and practices and, and trying with experimenting with slightly different leadership styles, again, more feminists. Um, you know, a bit more mindful about power dynamics, more reflective, more collective, and, and centering around feminist practices, which, which, you know, are more mindful about care and, and well-being. So I think that the, I think there's a, there are signals that this martyrdom culture is being called out, it's being kind of addressed, but we are really at the very, very beginning. And this is something that you don't change overnight. It's something it's no, it, it entails deep, deep cultural changes. Um, and when it comes to um, the male experience, if it's a culture dominated by male experience, it's not easy to, to answer. I find it difficult to generalize for the whole sector and across the world, but you know, looking again at the more traditional organizations, it has been the case, at least, you know, it has been in, in the recent past. Uh, in global INGOs, I'd say, you know, it's especially shaped by 
white Western male Anglophone um, men and the related culture that that you know brings that that brings. Um, according to the fair share initiative that I've mentioned before, on average, 70% of employees uh, at NGOs are women, and about 70% of the leaders are men. And so that speaks to, to, this, to, this, to this aspect of centering male experience through the leadership and the leadership style and the culture that leadership um, brings to, to organizations. Um, in large campaigning NGOs, I have observed an emphasis on the use of um, persuasion as a form of communication, more harsh language, um, more contentious internal politics, more confrontational styles, the kinds of the kinds of styles that, that are used for campaigning are kind of mirrored inside the organization. And I think that is is a is a so mirrors a bit of, of a more macho culture, male dominated um, culture. Uh, and again, the, the scandals that hit, you know, um, leading INGOs in the recent past, um, like Oxfam Amnesty or Save the Children and others, um, which have been implicated in scandals um, about various forms of abuse of power and harassment, including sexual abuse, are a symptoms of, of, of that kind of culture and and of a system that, that has been struggling for many years to recognize um, the manner in which these abuses um, are rooted in everyday power imbalances, which are gendered as well. And so that macho culture is, it has also make it very difficult to call out these uh, macho behaviors and, and to hold them accountable. So it's something that has been there for a while um, these scandals are, are, are definitely showing that there are not rotten um, apples, but it's a systemic, structural, deeply ingrained uh, problem in, the, in, the, in that system. Uh, but has triggered uh, you know, attention. The scandals have, I think, triggered some sort of change, as I said before. Um, I think there's a process of reckoning going on. Um, I, movements like the Me Too that became the Aid Too in the sector, or the, you know, Black Lives Matter with the charity so wide. These are these are also things that have accelerated. Now, in, in addition to the scandals, all this has accelerated. There is indeed a process of reckoning, um, but um, yeah, and and so you see things that are happening, like the Fair Share Initiative that I mentioned before, or Oxfam. International embracing feminist principles in their new 10 year strategy. These are some of the examples that do signal that, you know, this is some, they're trying to address this. Uh, and so things might be gradually changing. But again, we're talking about deep cultural shifts that you don't resolve through, you know, a formal policy, only through a formal policy or, you know, a, a regulatory measure or, or, or some sort of governance structure alone. Um, and so what, what I'm afraid of is, of is that what we're seeing now are really just uh, performative actions to show that, you know, something is being done to address this. Uh, but it will take us a while to see the, the deep transformations that, that we need to really change that male-centered, um, machist culture inside these organizations. Um, so I think inclusion aspects now are most Tick, tick the box thing or, or, or and not, not done without good intentions. Uh, no, don't, uh, I don't want to be misunderstood on this, but you know, you do really need a lot more time to bring this from an unconscious to the conscious and to, and to you know, transform the cultures with, within these organizations. So there's still a long way to go. Um, and what we're seeing now are, are mostly more, more visible performative kinds of actions that do signal to me, as I said before, that there's a reckoning and 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 something is is happening and, and moving in, in the sector. Okay. 
본의 아니게 코로나 때문에 재택을 하고 어, 그러다 보니까 지금 이걸 유지할 수 있는 거지 어, 제가 어느 시민단체에서 지금 그냥 일하고 있다고 출근해야 되고 있고 이렇게 어, 뭐지? 유동성 없는 그런 데서 일하고 있을 수 있다고 한다면 어, 저는 아마 저도 일을 못하고 그만두게 될것 같고 그러다 보면 은또 이렇게 경력 단절이 돼서 어려울 것 같고 그런 생각이 좀 들거든요. 그래서 조금 어 이런 뭐 경험을 기반으로 하는 게 아니라 그게 뭐지? 스펙이라고 해야 되나요? 그런 걸 기반으로 하는 게 아니라 어, 사람은 어, 그런 경험이 있고 없고를 떠나서 누구나 다 사랑할 수 있는 거잖아요. 시민단체 활동은 사람이 사랑할 수 있는 마음과 그각 각 사람의 그 인권을 서로 지켜서 지켜줄 수 있어야만 우리가 같이 행복할 수 있다. 그런 차원에서 해야 되는 거라고 생각하고 있기 때문에 그거는 경험에서 살아갈 수 있는 게 아니라고 생각해요. 단, 어, 여성들이 참여가 더 적다고 본다고 하면 저는 여성들 참여가 더 많다고 보는데 퍼센트 수는 많기 때문에 오히려 그 많다고 생각하는데 어, 적다고 보시는 분들이 있다고 하면 제 생각에는 여성들이 아무래도 아이를 낳고 와서 좀 좀만 살다 보면 아이를 낳고 결국 여성들이 못 보면 저는 뭐 하나 낳는 친구들이 많지 않은 것 같고 외롭다 보니까 두세 낳는 친구들이 많다 보니까 우리가 대략 탈 아무리 20년이 돼도 여기 와서 10년 넘는 사람들이 애 일곱 살 키우고 정도 되면 자기가 아직 사회인으로서 성기에는 아직은 어, 적은 시간이죠. 이제부터 아마 어, 10년 정도는 애를 키워놓은 사람들이 하겠죠. I think the, the question of, of funding and looking into funding and like really dissect this whole uh, atmosphere is, is very important when we are talking about this because um, at the end, civil society, uh, especially in contexts that are not um, not very welcoming to civic, civic society where there is no real civic space. Um, for example, yeah, like I'm talking about Syria and I would assume also for, for North Korea. Uh, Funding is a major major issue, and it's it's one of the main resources that that cripples. Um, the, the the main the main thing is that there, as as I mentioned before, I say that there is more progress towards supporting women, and a lot of donors, and especially international donors, are putting gender on the agenda. Uh, but still, how that translates in reality is is very different than how it looks on um, in the nice wordy uh, grant announcements um, so for example the reliance on on project based funding and output oriented projects that yeah this is uh, the funding is to result in one plus plus one there is less room for for space for creativity that it accommodate to to individual needs so the approach of yeah this is this is the project this is how it's done and this is how it should apply to each context is still a very um major like narrative that uh, that persists and that that limits women participation in a lot of areas because the the specific needs that cannot be reflected in a one fit all approach are not usually considered and this is most of the times is related to this structure of uh, um, of project fundings around the world that yeah looks into output oriented project based funding with very less um, room for um, for creativity and for contingency also in case something did not um, move according to um, to the plan um, this is in, in general a phenomena in all civil society, I would say, but when we are talking about uh, women related issues and uh, gender inclusion uh, agenda, this is more more evident uh, because here is where we need this this type of uh, flexibility. Um, at the same time, um, and one thing we have also um, focused on a lot in our research recently uh, is the trends that are coming out of this uh, do, do, like donor and uh, international donors agenda uh, with which is pushing towards projects that's uh, usually emptying any type of 
of movements like social movements and political movements of its content and pushing it towards forming uh, NGOs with clear structures that work according to strict policies and uh, very like frame set projects. Um, and this is the, um, the phenomena around the world has been uh, described as the NGOization, which is actually turning movements into NGOs and into just like mechanics of one, two, three, this is a checklist, how this is how we do projects and emptying it from the um, political and social aspects of it that can can reflect into it. Um, so this is still still a major challenge despite the progress that has been made into this, uh, especially I would say from international and Western donors who have put gender on their agendas also um, their domestic agendas, but it also reflects into international uh, development and humanitarian assistance. Uh, but it is still, uh, it's still far way to go uh, for women activists and women organization to push towards more, more inclusion and more um, flexible funding that takes their own needs and their own context into consideration. Starting from if these opportunities are suited to the lived realities of women in many parts of the world. So from what we've heard within our networks and from some of the analyses we've, we have carried out, I think the answer would be no. Um, so gender sensitive resourcing is critical to address these structural barriers that we've discussed before. And so we, we need more funding mechanism, mechanisms that begin to adapt better to respond um, to the nuanced needs of, of women in, in their organizing um, in civil society. Um, you know, there's a need to be sensitive to a range of dimensions that affect women or, you know, and women human rights defenders, um, not only because of, of them being women and the roles that they play in, in, in their communities, in their families, but also, you know, dimensions that, that, that look at their sexual orientation, their gender, their race, um, their age, their class, like, you know, their ability and, and other intersections. Um, and so, you know, there is non-gender focused funding out there. And of course it could still be, you know, reaching some of, of these women's rights or, and, and, and organizations and part, partly also reaching feminist movements. But the reality is that often without um, dedicated focus, these groups do not access the resources and, and the opportunities that there are out there. And so, for me, that is one more reason to, to really, you know, um, try to call for more support to the existing, uh, but also to the emerging and homegrown infrastructure of women funds and feminist funds and feminist organizations that are supporting the work that many women and women um, rights organizations are doing around the world. Um, one aspect that I'd like to highlight has to do with the inequitable access to resources, particularly for smaller and less formal groups, which is an area of work that we at Civicus have, have been um, prioritizing quite a lot. And, and it's a bit across the board, so it doesn't only af affect women organizations. But um, we have done a range of analysis and particularly in Latin America as a case study, but it, it does resonate um, with other regions. We've been looking and both at the offer and, and, and we'll be also um, serving many different civil society organizations on their experience of applying and accessing resources and grants from, from yeah, grant makers. And what we've seen is that the system is clearly inequitable in that it's really a privilege of the more established, well-resourced and better connected um, to have access to these opportunities. There are a range of barriers and transactional costs that make it almost impossible for smaller and less formal groups to access the grants that are being offered. In the first place, it's not easy to intercept these opportunities timely. These opportunities might be posted in some websites that you know, women, women organizations on the ground don't know about or maybe um, posted in and, and published in languages that are not the languages uh, spoken by these uh, by these groups and so they would they would very difficult it would be very difficult for them to intercept even intercept these opportunities or do so timely you no know, with enough time to then be able to apply this is the first barrier then 
The second barrier is that even when these opportunities get on the radar, it's not very clear, and this is what we've heard from many, many groups, whether these activities um, that, that these grants might be, might be covering are, are, are in line with the strategies and, and, the, and when the strategies and the priorities that these groups have, they are, they are never sure. It, it, it is always ambiguous or not clear. And so that is something that um, um, disencourages groups from applying. They never think that they qualify. One aspect that relates to the jargon, to the language, sorry, but not necessarily to the actual language is the jargon being used in these calls. Some groups don't know if they are, you know, human rights defenders. They don't identify as such, but they probably are, and they would qualify. It's just that the jargon makes it difficult for them to understand if they would qualify. And the difficult articulation of the, you know, priorities and strategies that you find in, in many of these calls make it really difficult for them to understand if, 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 if the kinds of work that they do or who they are is, is, is eligible. Thirdly, even if they tried <laughs> their luck, um, some eligibility, formal eligibility criteria are hard to meet in terms of being registered, having a bank account in the name of the organization, um, producing a track record of successful past experience. There are many groups that are not registered for a range of reasons and they can't produce that. They can't afford to have a bank account in their name of organization. It's too expensive. Um, they are recently established and, and not because of that less um, um, deserving of financial support, but they don't have that track record that is all, always required. So there are a range of, of objective barriers that make it impossible for them to apply because they don't qualify. And thirdly, even they, if they qualified, the process of submitting an application is so complicated. The forms are really difficult to understand. Every grant maker has their own form and format, so it becomes a nightmare to follow all these requirements and to and to be on top of this. And it it really it eats a lot of time for groups that perhaps don't have the possibility to spend so much time on this. And so, what we've heard from many is that they end up not applying. There are too many uncertainties and the times that they've applied and they've been unsuccessful, they've never heard back any sort of feedback that would help them next time to get better, to get you know, to increase their chances of, of being successful. So what we are seeing is that the time invested, invested in these at an organizational level, but also at an ecosystem level, reveals high inefficiencies so that sometimes the result, if, you, if you were to quantify the time, also monetize the time spent trying to understand these things or follow these things or apply to these opportunities of all the sector versus the amounts that are actually given, you would see that there is a big draining of resources and of time that could be differently you know, directed towards more mission critical work. So there's there's a lot of things there that we need to reconsider as support ecosystem because, you know, it's being inefficient, but it's also being inequitable. And what I um, what um, what we've um, what we've seen is that um, the success rate is almost zero for smaller groups. So the ones that they, we've interviewed, they've tried a couple of times and the success rate was almost zero. Um, so this is fueling a vicious cycle where established organizations that are well-resourced, that have fundraising teams, they can, you know, um, they can, they have, they, 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 they always have chances they, they, of, of accessing the resources. Whereas the groups that didn't make it or that they, for whatever reason, they're staying small, they aren't registered, they are or recently established, they will find it very difficult to, to enter this market. And by the way, they are placed in competition in many cases, one with the other. So we've done an analysis of calls and we've seen that the vast majority are, are, are accessible for all kinds of groups, irrespective of size um, and, and, and typologies. So you have you find yourselves, you know, that the offering out there. Um, is the same that is offered to big organizations which have a fundraising arm in, with, with, against which you would never be able to, to compete. Um, and going to your question about the capacities, so I think it, it's not an, an aspect of um, 
the, sorry, the capacities to employ to employ experienced staff. So I think it ha it speaks to the to the size of organizations. Of course, there must there there are women's rights organizations that are big enough, and they have their fundraising teams, and they can afford that. And this and, then, and this applies to women's organizations as well as other organizations. But then you have smaller organizations who don't have a fundraising team. You, you know, if you think of small collectives or, or, or kind of rather informal groups, they don't have a fundraising team. What they told us is they oftentimes use the volunteers that work with them or, the, or, or some of their own time. But these are, again, uh, people that are not specialized in these and, and therefore the, the quality of, of the proposals that they, that they are able to produce oftentimes does not meet the expectations. So again, the system needs, I think, to reconsider the whole process in ways that are more tailored for specific groups, looking at different aspects, you now the kinds of groups that they, they wish to support. And so in, in, the, in, in the case of women organizations are more gendered sensitive approaches, but also looking at the sizes and, and, and trying to cater for different kinds of, of groups across the board yeah? and, and not standardize so much the processes because this is in itself a big cause of, of exclusion. Um, I think you were asking something around cash reserves and, and unfortunately I, I don't have data on this so I cannot say whether women are less able to, be, to build cash reserves it definitely, it, I don't think it has to do anything with an innate lesser ability to build cash reserves. If anything, it probably would have to do with the um, sort of the, these more structural imbalances that we were talking about. And so A, the difficulty of accessing funding in general, and B, the quality and quantity of, of, funded, of, of funding that is offered would affect their ability, their possibility to build cash reserves. If we look at quantitative aspects, again, we know that less than one person, and if we think of, again, um, groups in the global south, we know that, for example, less than 1% of ODA goes directly to groups based in the global south. The, the vast majority of ODA that is earmarked for civil society is channeled through big, big INGOs. And then, um, and then, but, so they are the ones who might get some possibilities to build reserves through some of this funding, depending on where it does allow, you know, to, uh, to use the funding for core purposes and uh, including building, building reserves. Um, a situation is not dissimilar in the private philanthropic landscape. Uh, the data of um, human rights funder networks and, and Candid, um, who have been reviewing um, philanthropic funding um, over, over, I think, five, the last five, six years, reveals that also there only 12% of funding goes directly to groups on the ground. And, um, and so, and, and very, very few of, 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 and a very little percentage of this funding is, is actually for human rights work. And we also know that within the human rights work, a tiny percentage is for women human rights work. And so, Quantitative wise, we see that the quantities are ridiculously small. If we look at quality, what, what we've seen, for example, in, in the analysis that we did in Latin America, where we reviewed more than 6,500 calls for proposals that were issued over four, a four year period, less than 3% of all the offering that we've been really inclusive, like everything that could more or less directly be uh, are an opportunity for civil society. We've included it in that coverage. And um, less than 3% of all that was actually directed to building the institutions and to, and to, and to and going towards core um, funding. The rest is project funding. And with project funding, you cannot build reserves. You are bound to implement a project and to keep on adding projects to your to your work as if social change can can could only be you know could always be projectified straight jacket into projects that are linear you know that are time bound that are um, that are um, always leading to expected results and and social change is not like that and so as I said, the quantity of resources available is really limited and if you look at human rights work and women's work, 
it's really a fraction of that already limited. And if you look at the quality of funding, very, very, very few organizations are able to access core funding or, or support that is more looking at building their institutions, including, you know, of course, cash, cash reserves.
어, 사람에 대해서 얘기하고 정부가 나쁘다는 얘기를 하고 있지만 중, 가장 큰게 그런 부분이 있기 때문에 그렇지 않을까라는 생각이 들고 음, 펀딩을 이때까지 제가 외국 펀딩을 받아본 단체는 없어서 잘 모르겠고 근데 스타국민들 펀딩 받기가 어려운 게 일단 영어가 안 되고요. 해외 펀딩을 받으려면 어, 국내 펀딩을 받으면 사업비 정도를 받는데 그 사업비 받으면 유지, 이 운영비는 없기 때문에 유지하기가 좀 쉬우, 쉬, 쉽지 않은 상황이고 확장하기가 어려운 상황이고 어, 해외 펀딩을 받으려고 하면 영어가 돼야 되고 일단 영어가 돼야 정보를 습득할 수 있는데 그게 어려워서 잘 못하는 것 같고 그리고 어, 유지하는 그래도 이런 단체들 보면 저는 어, 좀 유동성 있게 할수 있는 단체들인 것 같아요. 음, starting from the last point, I think civil society organization need and have to uh, be more vocal about this. Um, civil society, civil society organizations, and especially women, women-led and women-focused women civil society organizations, actually have the duty of uh, of issuing this. And at the end, this is one of um, of the rules of civil society. If we are taking it to the basics, is to adv advocate for uh, disadvantaged groups. Um, and no matter how much progress there has been, this this should always remain a priority for civil society organizations to push toward and um, focus, advocate for a more inclusion for for women in funding schemes, uh, but also in different types of supports. Um, we always talk about donors and grants making in terms of access to financial resources, but other resources are not less uh, important. Um, as we were talking before about uh, about knowledge production and about awareness and about access to resources, um, access to, to networking opportunities and sharing experiences are things that also need to be incorporated in uh, in the way that we look at civil society work and we, the way that we, we and donors look at grants is that it's not only a one project that's isolated here from start to end we close it we complete the paperwork we put it on the drawer and that's done it's all working in one one context and it's all interacting with each other uh, building a <clears throat> long-term support that builds an accumulative experience and allow for uh for sharing experiences is is as relevant as conducting gender audits or uh, requesting that uh, a woman quota, for example, in the project um, project staff or in the organization staff, these are the these quantitative aspects have been the focus, and they are a good start. They are not bad that at least donors now are looking when an organization is applying for a grant to see uh, if they have women in their decision making processes or uh, if they have any um, gender policies or if their pol internal policies supports the inclusion of women and accommodates for their uh, for their specific needs. This is a start, but these quantitative measures should not be the only way to to judge because at the end it's it's becoming more at looking at the um, at the shell rather than the the inside than the essence of what's actually going on um because we we always know that having uh having X number of women in the organization does not necessarily reflect their decision-making ability within this organization. Uh, so looking at only the numbers and uh, um, the existence or non-existence of policies is a good start, but it's not enough. Because even if we have policies, we need to look into, are these policies really being applied? Are these policies are sufficient for the specific context and specific needs of this organization or uh, or this context or this place? Um, the same um, the same goes for uh, for project structures that uh, yeah, inclusion of um, a, a specific percentage of women staff in a project does not mean that they have the decision making um, abilities or they don't have the agency to actually be active. And this all reflect in this. Um, uh, I heard the term like tokenization of women that, yeah, we should have, we include women in the organization because that looks better to the donors, but how actually are these women active in their places? And this is, this is a tricky issue because it can, it can backfire. It can turn into a phenomena at the end of having this just like formal appearances of gender inclusion, uh, 
and this is driven by the way that these policies are applied and these agendas are applied. So uh, main thing I think for, for donors that needs to focus on more is how to look into the qualitative participation of women in organization rather than just the quantitative um, indicators of it. Um, and at the same time, focusing, as I mentioned, on uh, long-term support that's not bound to uh, to project timeframes uh, of three to six months. And then, yeah, we did a project to support women in this region, and it's done, and we closed it. Uh, these are building on each other, but looking at the issue from a more systematic point of view is what's actually needed to make a difference. So... Yeah, certainly there is a need to incorporate gender responsive structures, practices, you know, and, and more radically inclusive approaches that recognize and value diverse lived experiences. And, um, and indeed, women's realities and women's well being should be at the center of designing any resourcing and support mechanism. Um, but of course, without having women meaningfully engaging in these spaces where the design of this mechanism, the conceptualization of the strategies happen without having them really in, in, you know, in conversation, it becomes difficult. So what we've seen is that um, where this happens, where there has been, uh, of course, a, you know, a, a meaningful representation in grant making spaces, then you do, you do have uh, more gender responsive structures and and um, and more relevant uh, approaches and mechanisms. Some of the grant makers taking a lead um, are, I think, indeed feminist funds. If you think of Frida, they, you know, or or I don't know, Fondo Semillas in Mexico, you have community philanthropy organizations that are also very mindful of including, you know, the the actual people with lived experiences like, I don't know, Tewa in, in Nepal or um, other, you know, activist-led funds in general, like Uhai in East, in East Africa. Um, many of these have actually adopted participatory grant-making approaches, so they really are embedding this principle of um, nothing about us without us, so really having you know, people with lived experiences in, in the cases that I've mentioned, women mostly in the decisions on how and who um, to, to, to offer grants and support and, and resources. So, it, 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 you know, there are, there, are, there are no short of examples of, of more, you know, radically inclusive and meaningful approaches. And in many instances, these are constituency led. So women led with women, you know, in, in, in the case of women, opportunities for women um, are there. Um, I think that um, we do see, for example, I mean, I, I could think of our experience with our own back donors. Um, and there are some who are starting to um, request uh, statistics or gender audits to us, no? when they vet us for potential partnerships. So there are donors and big donors that are starting to take also approaches like this to ensure that um, you know there are more equitable policies inside the organizations and the sector now as, as donors there are some that are also trying to vet these when they when they when they consider potential partnerships um, of course these are pros and cons the pros is that you feel you know you have to adopt if you do want to receive that kind of support and important support you need to you know set yourself up in in that sense the other the back the the the, the flip side is that again this this can also be just surface work tick the box kind of thing so you know you we, you hopefully need to complement that with 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 deeper um commitments at, at the organizational level <laughs> 아까 뭐 얘기한 거 답이 있을 것 같으면서 나는 좀그 사람들이 그러니까 다양한 사람들이 참여하고 그러니까 막 일을 하는 사람은 여러 사람하고 있다면 사실 같은 사람 사람들이 관계가 힘들어서 어려운 거잖아요. 그래서 오히려 한 사람을 여덟 시간 쓰는 게 같이 일하는 게 맞는 거지 업무 효율도 나고 오히려 한뭐세 시간 일하는 사람을 세 명을 두는 것보다는 같이 일하는 것보다는 오히려 어, 능률은 한 사람하고 일하는 게더 낫기 때문에 그렇게 할것 같아요. 근데 어, 나는 시민 사회 활동은 좀 
많은 사람들이 참여할 수 있게 하고 많은 그런 여성의 그 사실은 장점인데 아이를 이 저출산 시대 아이를 낳고 한 생명을 키우는 건 여성들만이 할수 있는 특권인데 그거를 잘 살려서 사회 활동도 할수 있게 할수 있다고 하면은 저는 그게 좀 어, 단시간 국무제가 시민 사회 활동에서 있다고 하면 장점이 돼서 더 참여하는 사람들이 많아지지 않을까라는 생각이 좀 있어요. I think there has been a lot, and when we are talking about donors and grants makings, we are putting them all in the in the one place, which is uh, at the end not not accurate because also um, among donors and grant makers, there is also differentiations and variations. Um, I would say on the international level, there is um, a few um, few donors and main decision makers in this whole uh, sector um, that are paying more attention and they are actually pushing towards more feminist agenda. Uh, and especially I'm talking about donors with a feminist agenda uh, behind it. Um, so this, that take these challenges into consideration that offer more flexible funding that allows for space to, uh, to listen to women need who are to support and not um, mainly enforce a top-down approach. Um, a few of them are, are in this sphere and I think their, their efforts, and of course, um, I would assume, or from the ones I know, I know that they are also women-led, which also makes sense because um, at the end when um, women are uh, participating actively in donor organizations, they can also shape the agenda in a way that responds better to, to women's needs. Uh, so when we are talking about women participation in civil society organization, um, I think like from, from my, my type of work and my involvement, we focus a lot on the local level, but it is as important to have it in the, on the international and the donors level when we have donors uh, that have um, their own inclusion policies and they have um, women in decision-making processes and they imply a feminist agenda, then we can see more progress in this. And um, I think this is something that's starting to accumulate with the time and we are need getting to know more and more funding programs that take this, um, this into consideration. Um, some funders um, prioritize uh, groups that are clearly constituency led. So if, if, if it's a group that is working on women's rights, it's women led. Uh, you know, on disability rights is led by people with disability. It's constituency led. And so some funders are starting more and more to look at that more uh, more as, as, um, as a way to uh, ensure that there, there's more inclusiveness and, and better and more equal representation, but also that these groups can demonstrate that they are accountable to the communities, to the people that they claim to represent and serve, and, and in this case, no, women's groups, et cetera. So, uh, you know, the, there are some approaches that I have noticed funders are taking to tackle this possible gaps in opportunities that have to do both no, with some internal um, audits and, 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 and safeguarding policies and, and, and approaches, as well as um, looking at the leadership, looking at the, at the real accountability lines, um, and then others, of course, create dedicating, dedicated funding lines for um, for, for example, women rights work and organizations. No? Like, for example, I know because I've been following that more closely, but the Dutch Minister of Foreign Affairs have, has as, 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 as a dedicated um, line of, of support to, to women's rights and, and, and gender equality work that is really just for that. Um, in terms of particular initiatives or mechanisms um, that seeks to build the capacities of women-led civil society organizations, well, I, I would imagine, and I think that that would be definitely the case, all women's funds, feminist funds and organizations and their various alliances have this agenda um, at, at, you know, at, at their center. Um, I can think of the recently launched Alliance for Feminist Movements, which is a multi-stakeholder partnership trying to mobilize more and better resources to support um, women-led civil society organizations. 
Um, I would imagine that the Equality Fund that was launched, I think, in 2019 is also another, another mechanism that is really trying to leverage a range of resources to support um, women-led groups, uh, which has an interesting aspect, I think, because it's not just a mechanism that um, redistributes grants from bilateral donors, but is, is, has been partnering also with um, impact investment um, entities um, and trying to embed feminist principles also in impact investing and investments that then produce returns that then can be also um, used to, you know, to, to mobilize resources for the sector. And one that I think does, uh, has uh, one initiative that has at, at its core the building of, of leadership uh, and building the institutional strengthening and strategies of organizations, which not necessarily is looking only at women-led organizations, is Ford's BUILD initiative. I, I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's a grant-making approach that is focused on helping social justice organizations become stronger and, and more resilient off by offering um, multi-year general support, which is important because it's a five years predictable core, core support that gives organizations you know, the time, the flexibility, and the predictability to understand that for the next five years, they can count with this kind of support that can be directed to core investments that really can you know, be directed to anything that the organization thinks is important to build their leadership, to build their infrastructure, to build the reserves, whatever they think it's important for them. And, um, and so um, it's, 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 it's something that I think has been very, very well, uh, you know, the, the, I think in, in the sector, there has been a lot of attention um, towards this model. And, 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 and I think all eyes are now on, on the impact to see if it is an impactful approach to build and strengthen institutional capacity and leadership of, of organizations. And then a completely different approach would be the one of Mackenzie Scott, who's kind of shaking a bit the ground of private philanthropy because in, in, in for instance, she has been giving donations, huge donations to groups that she has identified as trusted groups. Many of them are women-led and, and many of them are, um, are, are, are belong to, to to women rights uh, organizations, and um, and it's a different approach. It's 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 really a trust kind of more, more trust based, um, huge donation that's it's you know, of a scale that can really make a difference in in you know, in the impact that these organizations uh, want to want to achieve. Okay. 저는 그 오히려 시작 사람들은 열정은 더 많이 있다고 생각이 들어요. 그런데 이 사람들이 업무 역량이 약하, 정보 습득이라든지 이런 게 약하기 때문에 전문 인력과 하나씩 그 어, 예정한다면 지원하는 거라면 오히려 더 어느 한 단체에서 지원하는 것보다 더 사람을 키우는 일이라고 해야 되나 사람을 이렇게 성장하게 하는 계기가 되지 않을까라는 생각이 들어요. 왜냐면 어, 아까 얘기했는데 경험이 없어서라고 생각하거든요. 제 저는 저를 봤을 때 대학교 2학년 때 시민단체를 시작하다 보니까 어, 이 어디 시민단체에서 일해본 경험이 없는 거예요. 그래서 일반 기업에 대한 경험도 없는데 시민단체 경험도 없나 없으니까. 어떻게 이거를 운영해가고 어떤 시스템으로 돌아가는지 이, 이런 걸 전혀 몰라가지고 어려운 것같아요 근데 그 열정을 유지하고 더 싹트게 만들어 가자면 뭔가 조력자가 좀 필요한 것 같아요. 그래서 이런 전문 인력들이 좀 사람을 키우는 일들을 
배우는 입장에서 또 이렇게 같이 만들어가고 이런 시간 만들어가면서 배우기까지 한다면 시간을 줄이고 그 사람이 좀잘 음, 성장할 수 있는 계기가 되지 않을까 싶어요. 누구 밑에서 일해서 배우는 것도 있지만 만들어가면서 같이 성장해가는 것도 분명히 있기 때문에 그런 환경을 좀 만들어줬으면 좋겠다는 생각이 들어요. 상담도 물론 좋겠지만 각 단체마다 또다 다르기 때문에 그리고 좀잘 알아야 그에 맞는 상담을 해줄 수 있거든요. 물론적인 얘기만 하면 상담은 하다 보면은 어, 안 하게 되죠. 아픈데. 그러니까 같이 그걸 만들어가고 일하는 사람이어야만 그게 가능하겠죠. 음, yeah, I agree. It's definitely more approachable than a decade ago, and that that also goes back to the progress worldwide, of course, to to a varying degrees, in uh, in the inclusion of of, of mental health and uh, having a wider transparent discussion about it. Uh, I think the whole the whole issue and the whole questions goes goes back to the intersectionality of different, um, I would say, marginalization factor. Um, people with uh, uh, yeah, mental illnesses has been disadvantages in worldwide for, for years and years to, for centuries maybe. Uh, and a little bit progress has been made throughout the last yeah, decade or so. And this is being reflected also when we are talking about women with mental health. It's still a big challenge because yeah, it's, it's at the point of intersection of two major um, disadvantaged uh, points or um, uh, I would say fragility factors uh, based on stereotypes and because of the of the whole systematic uh, discrimination against both groups. So if we're talking about women with mental health, then we are uh, we are at the intersections of these two two points, unless we are also adding more factors like, for example, people of color or uh, areas with uh, with conflict and uh, any any. Any other factor outside the, I would say, the Western uh, First World um, or the Global North. Um, so this is um, this is not something that I have been focusing a lot on. Uh, I would say so. Don't have like concrete um, uh, input on it. But uh, yeah, at the end, it is something that's being more approachable. Uh, because of the uh, of the opening of the debate about this issue worldwide, but it is still uh, it's still a major uh, discriminating factor, I would say, that's uh, impacting in other in a lot of ways uh, women's ability to to be active in, in civil society, but also in other uh, public spheres. Um, we've spent the last two years in dialogue with many activists, um, and this came up across the board very strongly. So mental health issues and burnout are a, are a huge, huge problem, which has been a taboo, and it's still a taboo, and rarely adequately um, resourced or understood by the support and enabling organizations. Um, many of, of the activists we've spoken to um, relate the situation to the toxic narratives kind of connected to that martyrdom culture we've talked about before, but many are also these narratives that portray activists as superheroes. Superheroes as if they are not humans, as if they don't get sick, they don't get sad, they don't get exhausted, they don't feel pressure in their communities or whatever, you know, backlash they, they suffer, is, 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 it doesn't affect them, it doesn't hurt them. And they always now have to show up like that, like superheroes, because that's the narrative, that's the expectation. And so there's really a need to challenge this super toxic narrative and, and really allow for activists to be actually and rehumanize activists uh, as people and recenter their well being as a unit of impact for whoever wants to support them, um, their well being intended in a realistic way, psychosocial, but also financial, but also. Um, physical. And so this speaks a lot to the kinds of changes that, you know, grant makers and, and other enablers need to need to do in their own thinking of how to support um, activists, because um, having this perception that they are superheroes does affect a lot the way one can imagine the kinds of support that are needed. 
And so there's really a need to, to center conversations around this and to center, as I said, the well, uh, the well-being of activists as one of the important units of impact and metrics for, for the sector that wishes to support activists and, and their work. Um, there's a beautiful and poetic video that has been curated by an activist in the Philippines, and I'll, I'll share it with you because it's, it's, it's really, it's really um, sharing views about burnout and the mental conditions of activists and how difficult it is for them you know, to cope with them um, in, in, you know, in being this so, so much of a taboo. Um, so I think the first step is making this more visible indeed, surfacing how, the, this pro, how problematic these narratives are. Um, humanizing activism has to, has to be, you know, the way to go, rehumanizing re activism. And, um, and then of course, you know, there are a range of things that one can consider from offering dedicated funding for that, but also, you know, if you were more flexible in how funds could be um, used, then it would be up to, up to activists to decide to use, you know, to use this to receive that kinds of um, also support to allow them to rest. Um, you know, to really make sure that, that you know, rest, respite, um, safe spaces, you know, to be vulnerable um, and to heal together are also important. That's what we've heard across the board. Um, and yeah, revisiting also uh, the practices that crop makers and other neighbors have in, in being in relationship with, with these groups so that really care and well-being are centered, um, become central in, in, the, in these relationships. Um, also accepting that there are different ways of addressing mental health and burnout that are more culturally appropriate in different contexts. And so that, you know, one needs to also step back and understand that the ways that mental health and healing um, needs to be practiced are not just one way or the way that, you know, the people in the grant making organizations would imagine they are. So a bit more flexible and allow those um, to be um, defined um, by, by the groups that are in, that are, you know, um, Need, need in need of um, support, mental health support. Um, but this is a, this is really a, an important aspect that is, is as you, I think you've mentioned that in the question. It, it is uh, unlikely ten years ago something that is be, it's becoming uh, more clear and, and conversation are starting around it. Um, and and I think now it's up to the support infrastructure to make sure that that. That we understand that this needs to be, you know, become central in 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 the support, in the solidarity, and the enablement that is offered. 나는 모든 탈북민들은 다 역시적인 어려움이 있다고 생각이 들어요. 자기가 인지를 못할 뿐이지 다 어려운 그러니까 힘든 충격을 겪었기 때문에 그러니까 이상이 있는 사람이라는 게 아니라 마음의 이런 상처가 남들보다 크게 있고 큰 어려움은 궁금한 어려움이 아니기 때문에 다들 상처가 있다고 그게 경중의 차이 정도 분이지 다 있다고 생각하기 때문에 다 받아야 된다고 저는 생각이 들어요. 다 받았으면 좋겠어요. 그리고 음, 그런 친구들을 못본건 아니고 몇명 봤는데. 그게 치유가 안 되다 보니까 아이를 낳아도 건강한 아이가 될까라는 생각이 이제 3자 시점으로 보여지는 거예요. 그러니까 엄마가 즐거워야 아이들 즐겁게 키우고 그럴 텐데 안정적인 안정감을 줄수 있는데 엄마가 마음이 불안하니까 아이한테도 불안하고 그런 아이가 태어나니까 엄청 보채고 그러다 보니까 그 아이를 잘 해야 되는데 본인이 마음이 불안한 상황이기 때문에 아이한테도 이렇게 안정감을 줄수 없기 때문에 그렇게 해도 괜찮을까? 라는 생각이 드는 거죠. 그래서 악순환의 연결 거리가 끊기지 않고 악순환이 반복되는 거 아닐까라는 생각이 들었고 뭐 이런 사회복지 졸업하고 이런 열정이 있어서 탈북민들을 상담해주고 이런 일을 하고 싶어서 이런 구청인가 이런 데서 일하는 친구도 있었는데 
어, 힘들다는 거예요. 그 사람들의 근육을 다 들어주는 것도 그러니까 탈북민이어서 더 공감이 돼서 어, 상대들은 더 얘기하기가 좋겠지만 이분은 탈북민에서 더 공감이 되다 보니까 자기가 치유한 데서 같이 힘들어진다는 거예요. 그래서 그 일을 끝내나 못하고 그만둬가지고 나랑 막 상담하던 얘기가 있었어요. 그래서 그 친구는 되게 안정적으로 잘 사는 친구임에도 불구하고 어, 자기가 겪었던 그런 것들이 있기 때문에 같이 그 친구도 상담을 상담사들도 상담 받으면 상담을 한다더라고요. 그런 게 이루어지지 않고 자기만 그 얘기를 듣고 소화하기에는 힘들었던 거죠. 그래서 음, 우리 보면 매 사람마다 신변 안전 보안관이 다 있잖아요. 근데 나는 한 다섯 명씩 뭐 있다고 하는데 한 사람이 다섯 명씩 이렇게 담당관으로 있다고 하는데 나는 그런 신의 상담사가 오히려 그렇게 되어 있으면 좋겠다라는 생각이 좀 있어요. 그래서 그게 정부 차원으로 될수 있는 건 아니기 때문에 그런 걸 시민단체에서 할수 있다고 하면 언제든지 그, 음, 뭐, 그렇게 일할 수 있는 상담사를 모집해서 비용을 계속 지원, 그 사람이 원할 때마다 받을 수 있게 지원할 수 있다면 좋겠다라는 생각이 일단 있습니다. 아픈 마음이 그 상한 마음들을 드러내야 되는데, 드러내면 같은 탈북민으로서 그게 말이 새 나갈까봐 일단 못 믿어온 것도 있고, 그래서 탈북민 아닌 사람한테 하고 싶기도 하고, 그때 어떤 때는 탈북민 아닌 사람은 너무 공감을 못하니까 탈북민의 사람을 하고 싶기도 하고, 신뢰가 쌓이야 되는 부분도 있고, 돈을 주면서 한다고 해도 거기 가서 그런 프로그램으로 아예 하게 되면은 거기 있는 사람들 다 알게 되잖아요. 그런 노출이 힘든 한 자체가 그 잘못, 그러니까 좀 잘못됐다기 보다는 사람들이 많이 참여할 수 있는 구조가 아니라는 거죠. 그러니까, 나도 상담을 받고 싶은데, 어, 우리가 상담풀이 이렇게 있다고 하면, 어, 이런 분들이 있는데, 여기서 어떤 사람을, 몸이랑 상담하고 싶습니까? 이렇게 해서 매칭해주는 식으로 하면은 될 텐데, 그냥 사람들 모집해서 이 사람이 이렇게 하는 식으로 하면은, 어, 잘안 하고 싶을 것 같아요. 네, 제가 그런 프로그램을 참여해 본 적은 없어요. 그래서 정확히는 얘기할 수는 없지만, 사람을 모집해서 그런 걸 하는 것 자체가 좀 힘들 것 같아요. 그런 일만 하는 단체가 있다고 하면, 어, 개별적으로 힘든 사람들이 언제나 한번 두드려서 찾을 수 있어서, 개인적으로 기억들해 줄수 있는 그런 게 돼야 되는 거지, 어떠한 어, 이번에 기술 사업을 하듯이 이렇게 뭐지? 어, 업무 사업 하듯이 하면은 참여하기 어려운 부분이 없는 게 아닐까? 그리고 대한민국에서는 사는 사람들은 감기처럼 생각한다 할지라도 북에서의 우울증 같은 거는 뭐 우울증 자체는 인지 못했던 것 같고 제가 살 때는 지금은 어떤지 모르겠지만 어, 정신병, 이렇게 정신적으로 이상이 있어서 이렇게 사람이 이렇게 돌아서 막 사람 구분 못하고 막 나쁜 짓 하고 이런 경륜이 이렇게 막 이런 사람들을 가는 사실 꼭그 정신병원이라고 있기 때문에 그런 사람들처럼 생각하고 있어서 되게 부정적으로 생각하고 있거든요. 그 한참 있다가 자기가 힘들고 아무리 그렇지 않다고 해도 선뜻 가게 안 되는 거지. 왜냐면 우리가 겪은 아픔들이 그렇게 어 일반적이지 않기 때문에 일반적이지 않은 아픔이기 때문에 어, 드러낼 수 있는 신뢰가 부족되는 그런 사람들이 아니면 어렵죠. 그럼 아니면 말 아예 모르는 사람한테 얘기하는 게 나은 거고 네, 그런 부분들이 